Our scripture reading this morning is from James 3, 13 to 4, 3, and 7 to 8a. Over the last three weeks, James has shared some powerful insights about what it means to hear and listen, what it means to be less concerned about how much power someone has instead of offering respect to everyone we meet, and what it means to own the power of the words we choose. This week, James continues to challenge both the early Christian church and us as he writes about wisdom rooted in humility and how envy and ambition can distract us from the call of the gospel. Who is wise and understanding among you? Let them show it by their good life, by deeds done in the humility that comes from wisdom. But if you harbor bitter envy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast about it or deny the truth. Such wisdom does not come down from heaven, but it is earthly, unspiritual, demonic. For where you have envy and selfish ambition, there you find disorder and every evil practice. But if the wisdom that comes from heaven is first of all pure, then peace-loving, considerate, submissive, full of mercy and good fruit, impartial and sincere. Peacemakers who sow in peace reap a harvest of righteousness. What causes fights and quarrels among you? Do they come from your desire that battle within you? Your desire, but do you desire, but do not have, so you kill. You covet, but you cannot get what you want, so you quarrel and fight. You do not have because you do not ask God. When you ask, you do not receive because you ask with wrong motives, that you may spend what you get on your pleasures. Submit yourself then to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. So come near to God, and he will come near to you. Wash your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. This is part of our Christian story. Thanks be to God.
I'm going to invite us to gather together in prayer once again. Let's pray together. Be near us, O oh God, as we ponder these ancient words written to an ancient people in a place that sometimes feels far away. Help us see how the words once spoken and shared are still relevant, still powerful, still transformative and help us to ponder and then reflect how they affect our lives. Bless, O God, the words of my mouth, the hearts and minds and spirits of those that will hear them and help turn them into action. Amen. This letter from James continues, and as Betty reminded us, it's kind of been weaving some themes together that are just as current and just as real today as they were when the letter was first penned to that Christian community in and around Jerusalem. As I've said before, it's one of those things that whenever you get more than one person together, you start to have disagreements. And that's assuming you don't actually disagree with yourself. The notions of envy and ambition start to come out, and, and who wants what, and why do they want it, and who has gifts and skills, and who wants you to notice them, and why do they want you to notice them, to what end, what are they trying to accomplish, are they trying to laud it over you or me or, or someone else? I remember very early on being told by an elder as I sat in a church meeting, be weary of those who volunteer right away. And I remember saying to them afterwards, well, why would I do that? I mean, if we ask for volunteers, isn't that the whole point to say, yeah, I'll do help out? And his comment was, there's one thing to say I'll help, and there's another thing to say I want to run it. Beware of those that volunteer too quickly especially if they want to run it. That, that was his advice to me, and, and their advice kind of has stayed with me throughout my years as I've grown and, and matured and wrestled with what kind of wisdom was really within that statement. I think at the end of the day, it comes down to a notion of humility. That's the, the antidote, if you will, for, for envy and ambition. The antidote is humility. And for most of us, I think we have a, a, a slightly twisted understanding of what humility really means. We think it, it's kind of like debasing yourself or, or putting yourself down. It, it's that notion of being less than and talking about yourself that way. But, but last week, you know, we talked about how those internal and external soundtracks that we tell ourselves, how they affect who we are as people and how we see our community if you actually believe you're somehow less than other people, then at some point you'll start to say that. And at some point you'll start to expect it. And at some point you'll actually start to act like it. And that's not being humble. At least that's not what I think is talked about as humility in Scripture. Rather, I think it's much like our, our operating systems, how we understand the world, how we see it, the values we attach to the world. It, it might need to be updated, which isn't an unusual thing in our world. On Monday, the latest iPhone operating system is going to come out. It's the 15th full upgrade. There have only been 13 iPhones. There's more operating systems than there were phones. And that doesn't talk about the ones in between and the patches, and the security upgrades. We're regularly upgrading the, the operating system of our devices, so why not upgrade the way we look and see the world? Why not provide patches to things like how we understand humility so that it can be richer and more informative, more grounding than just simply debasing ourselves? One could say that a definition of humility can, can be found in the root words. Humility comes from the Latin word humilitas. And that's a, a noun related to the term humble. Yet it also means 
grounded or from the earth, as it also derives from the term humus, which means earth. If you take that at at face value, being humble isn't about debasing yourself or saying you're not good enough. It's about grounding yourself in who you really are. Knowing yourself fully and completely and engaging the world from that point of being grounded in your identity. See, when you're grounded in your identity like that, then then you can do things like admit, I'm not perfect at everything. Believe it or not, I'm not. There are times I say stuff I wish I didn't. Times I interpret things that other people say where I go, wow, I can't believe they said that to me. And before I know it, I'm all fired up and I'm ready to fire off that email that I really should at least sleep on or that text message I really should delete and just put, okay. I make mistakes because I'm human. But being able to understand that, while at the same time saying, do I also have strengths, is what being humble is about. It's grounding ourselves. So that as we move through life, we can update our OS and and engage one another in more complete and more holistic and fuller kinds of ways, recognizing that actually the only way that I can balance out some of those pieces where I fall short is with you. I can't do it without you. I can't do it without community. St. Vincent de Paul said this, humility is nothing but truth and pride is nothing but lying. Humility is nothing but truth. It's that, that utter grounding. It's that, that pure reflection in the mirror. It's that 4K, super high depth, zoomed in kind of perception of yourself. It's nothing but truth. An honesty with who you are. And pride, similar to, to envy, It's nothing but lying. Lying to yourself. I am a great artist. Well, I'd like to be a great artist, but I know I'm not a great artist. Rebecca's a great artist. I can barely draw a straight line. No matter how great I think that straight line is, I'm not an artist. Telling myself I am misses the point. And I think lots of times that's when we get ourselves in trouble. We, rather than being honest with ourselves, rather than grounding ourselves in who we truly are and who we're called to be in the world, we tell ourselves these little lies and we kind of convince ourselves that we're something that we're actually not and we go out into the world and we engage with one another and we get ourselves in so much trouble. Rather than sticking to what we know. Now, I don't mean limiting how you grow. I don't mean limiting how you learn and how you engage the world, but rooting ourselves in what we know and the values that shape and mold us and engaging the world from that point of view. C.S. Lewis, talking about humility, wrote this. Humility is not thinking less of yourself. It's thinking of yourself less. There's a huge difference in that simple phrasing. Right? It's not about thinking less of yourself. That's what I was talking about. That that's not being humble. Thinking less of yourself. That's humility. Not that I'm less than you, but I need to think of you before I think of myself. I think ultimately that's what James is trying to get at in this letter 
to this early Christian church that was having all kinds of trouble and difficulty trying to figure out who it was and what it was doing and how it was going to get along and how they related to one another and what to do when arguments break out because, let's face it, arguments break out no matter where you are or what kind of group you belong to. That's the reality of human interaction. We don't all just believe that the other person is right. Well, unless they agree with how I think it should be. And, and then we tend to agree with them pretty quickly. But otherwise, there's always those friction points. And some of us, depending on your personality type, mine would be one of them, by the way, just like to kind of debate the issues. Like, just take the opposite side, whether you believe it or not, because in the push and pull, something else often shakes out. We just like to debate stuff for the fun of debating. Believe it or not, some of us really do love that. We don't call it arguing. It's discussion. Right? But I know not everybody is like that. And that's one of the pieces I had to come to realize. I'm like that when I push every time some folks make comments, they don't experience it as an invitation for conversation. They experience it as me saying, you're wrong, and if you were smart, you'd stop talking and listen to me. That's not what I'm trying to accomplish. But it takes a certain humility to realize that's what's happening. Rose Dorish used to stand up here, and, and every now and then she would share with her, us some of her stories. Now, lots of you know Rose, but if you don't know Rose, she passed away recently, and, and she was an older lady that, that used to sit kind of in the middle of the congregation. And she had all kinds of reasons to be grumpy, and I'm not sure I ever experienced her that way. She was a little unstable on her feet, but that didn't stop her either. When we sang certain hymns, she was usually the first one to get up and she'd start to move, and the next thing you know, she'd be in the aisle and she'd be dancing, and I'd be holding my breath because I was sure she was going to fall. And I'd be trying to sing along, but at the same time kind of ready to, to go if she fell. But one of the pieces that Rose used to say when I'd go to visit her or when she was talking to all of us, was she would talk about the humble brag. It's okay to humble brag. And her piece was, it's okay to say you're good at something. To know you're good at it, realize you're good at it, and live within that. But it's not okay to laud that over somebody else. But it is okay to ground yourself in that reality. That's the way I would describe it. That's not quite how she did and so she would name the, the humble brag things. She'd done a lot of stuff in her life. It's okay to do that, but do it from the point of view of humility. Do it from the point of view of being grounded in who you are and grounded in the Christian tradition and the way in which we engage the world. My experience is when you can do that, you're more able to see where others have skills and gifts and abilities that you just don't. You're more receptive. You're more open to saying, let's do this together. I bring this to the table. You bring that together. We can do more than any one of us can on our own. There's a, a synergy to it. And I think that's what happens when we look at our, our OS and how we look at the world. It's what happens when we, when we say our our core values that kind of shape us as a community are living faith, inclusive fellowship, joyful service, being anti-racist, and affirming all. Those are the five things that undergird us, five things that shape us and mold us, five things that ground us, that, that help us in all humility do the things that we do. Not because we want a pat on the back. Not because we want someone to give us a, you know, a long write-up in the paper or an award or whatever. But because when we ground ourselves in those values and in the Scripture and in the tradition that supports them, we know who we are. 
and we know the difference we can make in the world. So don't be afraid to to upgrade your operating system. You might want to check in advance to make sure it'll work. You know? Don't take on something too radical and say, oh, all of a sudden I'm going to become a mountain climber. You might not want to do that. You know, the odds of becoming an Olympic swimmer or an Olympic hockey player for most of us at this stage in our lifespans is pretty slim. But you might be able to learn how to skate. And you might become really, really good at stopping when you skate. You might take up something else. You might perceive the world just a little bit differently. And that's okay. I think one of the things that James would say to us is that if you aren't evolving and changing, if your operating system isn't being updated, if your sense of identity and core self isn't being grounded and tested and then grounded again, then that's not a living community. So let's engage the world. And let's take the risk of being truly humble with one another. Amen.